Hi, listeners. There are one or two swear words in this episode, so if you are with someone who shouldn't hear that or doesn't want to, you have been warned. I started coming to the Fringe initially in 1972, properly since 1973. So this is my 50th anniversary. I love living in the city. August makes it even better, and I would never leave the city during the summer. It takes around four and a half hours to travel from London to Edinburgh on the train, as I did in the middle of August, the middle of the Fringe. The train was packed. You travel up through the middle of England, then head towards the coast. Shortly after you hit the Scottish coast, the train turns inward. When you see what seems like castle walls emerge on the train side, you have arrived at Waverley train station in the heart of Edinburgh. I've still got so many friends up in Edinburgh or friends who've gone all around the world and they also come back to Edinburgh during the fringe. It's an opportunity. Everyone's kind of drawn back magnetically to Edinburgh once a year. So it's a chance to catch up with friends, to get on stage with people I don't get to perform with for the rest of the year and to just enjoy that feeling of getting to go on stage every night or every other night and just put on a show to an audience who want to be there, who've paid to see it. It's, it's hard to find that feeling anywhere else. Waverly Station dates back to the 19th century and is situated in the middle of Old Town and New Town. New Town is slightly misleading as the first buildings were built in 1767. To be fair, though, Old Town is over a thousand years old, so I guess in that regard, 1767 is new. The castle walls you think you see from the train is actually Carlton Hill. There are seven hills in Edinburgh, same as Rome. The actual castle, Edinburgh Castle, sits on top of a hill called Castle Rock, looking over Edinburgh as it has done in some form since the 11th century. Humans have been on Castle Rock since the Iron Age. One look at Edinburgh Castle, and you can see how it might have inspired the magical world of Harry Potter, which was written in Edinburgh. The the draw was, it was too strong to not respond to the siren call of Fringe this year. Also, it's a tradition to come every year. It's, It's nice seeing new things. It used to be a way of seeing things cheaper than in London. As you exit Waverley Station, you are met with the sounds of wheels on cobbled streets, and you are also immediately hit with billboards and posters for shows that line the streets. I choose to bring a bag as I need the ability to zoom around tourists and punters trying to figure out their next move. So I would describe Fringe as Times Square all day, every day, taking over the city. But then you add on the fact that it's a fair, like a sales fair. So you're walking down a super crowded street. There's all sorts of people looking lost and confused and not paying attention, being distracted. And then people are shoving flyers in your face. It's like an adult festival. It really is. It's like a a citywide festival that's all day, every day for the entire month of August. And then on the performer side, it's very, very different, right? I often talk about the fringe from a performer side as being the Olympics for performers. It's our one big world stage shot that we're brought together in this humongous way. It is a gauntlet. It will change your life. It'll deeply change you. Between a pandemic and having a baby, this would be my first fringe since 2019. And it seemed in that time, I forgot one golden rule I learned after my first fringe. Don't cram too much in. Because as I left Waverly on the opposite side than I needed to, I realized I had just over an hour to get to the hall or dorms for my American listeners. I was staying at, check in, drop off my luggage and get to my first show. It was tight, but I could do it, I think. It's finally the fringe, where I will be climbing up and running up ancient hills and filling my boots with all the fringe has to offer. And see if it's changed in the years since I've been. I'll check in on Neve and Hannah to see how their fringe is going, and if it is everything the past several months have built it up to be. I'm Molly Merwin at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, and this is Fringe Benefits Edinburgh, a story of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Nice. Last day before my day off. 
I meet Neve at her venue just before 10 o'clock on my second day at the Fringe to fly her for her show. You might have figured out that her show is the one I was flyering for in the first episode. She only had eight pre-sale tickets that morning for her 60-seat venue, so she wanted to make sure we were out and ready right at 10. Neve has been flyering every day at 10 o'clock, then having a student flyer from 11 to 12 before her show at 1 o'clock. She's looking happy, maybe because the next day is her day off. She also recently had some good reviews and almost a sold-out show with 50 people. Neve gives me the turning death into a living call-out, and we begin our journey. Hi, yeah, Carrot of Comedy, turning death into a living. Thanks. You know? No worries, I understand. I uh, know, it's really fun. Four star Soho Theater Lab. We start out at Bristow Square, a hot spot with Underbelly, Gilded Balloon, and the Pleasants having venues nearby. Underbelly has a huge food and bar area there, which is great to meet up with friends before or after shows. At this time, there are a lot of families because while the vast majority of friends shows are for adults, in the morning, you'll find family and kids shows. There are a growing number each year. The Pleasant set up a kids zone for families about 10 years ago and now sells 50,000 tickets for children. After only a little bit of interest in Bristow, we head over to the Royal Mile. On our walk, Neve and I begin the traditional friend show recommendation talk, exchanging suggestions based on what we have seen or heard about. Fringe recommendations is a standard conversation starter at the Fringe, at coffee shops, pubs, or standing in the queue. That's in line for my North American listeners for a show. Character comedy turned death into a... Okay, thank you. The Royal Mile is the hotbed for flyering. It's the main thoroughfare in Edinburgh's old town. It's lined with shops and cafes with Edinburgh Castle and the Palace of Holyrood at each end. Here you will find buskers, punters, performers flyering and promoting their shows, and residents just trying to get on with their day. I have often wondered what Edinburgh residents think about these festivals taking over their city every year. Each time I speak to a resident in a pub or at a show, they seem to love it. They're even proud. According to the Fringe Society, Edinburgh residents purchase the largest number of tickets. I love living in the city. August makes it even better. And I would never leave the city during the summer. That's Adrian, an Edinburgh city resident I met on my first day at the Fringe. He has been coming to the Fringe for over 50 years and comes to 45 to 50 shows during the month. A man after my own heart. Do you know if there are any people that don't like Fringe or other festivals taking over? I'm afraid I think there are people, and I know some of them, but uh, they're in the minority, and that's their thing. I don't want to argue with them. I like it. It doesn't bother me. Why do you think they don't like it? I think they don't like crowds. Yeah, it's fair. It's, it's, a, it's a fair thing. But you like it. You love it. I buy into it completely. When you live here, it's just things that happen in the city for some people. It's- That's Cammy Day, Edinburgh City Council leader we heard from in episode two. I think most people think it's an amazing thing. There are, of course, people who think it's just annoying. You have to fight their way through crowds of people to get to work. That could probably be a bit annoying, to be fair. But when you think of the huge economic benefit to the city, it, it, it creates thousands of jobs in the city that run hotels, bars, restaurants, and everything else that goes along. And, and, and maybe more excitingly, it gives young people uh, an opportunity to do something quite wild, actually. I think it's quite exciting. There's always been a love-hate relationship between mm-hmm. people who live here and the, the circus which descends upon the city every August. My name is Tommy Shepherd. I'm the Member of Parliament for Edinburgh East. And before that, I was the full-time owner and director of the Stand Comedy Club. On the what? one hand, a lot of people think it's thrilling, mm-hmm. exciting, it makes the city extremely lively. The bars stay open till all hours of the, the, the morning. It has a vibe about it that you will not get in many places, and you certainly wouldn't get it in a city of half a million people. So it does give a unique flavor and experience to living in Edinburgh, and I think people appreciate that, and they appreciate the artistic and cultural content as well, but at the same time, it makes it very hard to get across town to get to work in the morning if you've got uh, 30,000 people trying to go and see a show in front of you. And so it's the congestion that comes with that, the pressure on prices, the pressure on accommodation, that all has a material effect upon the the people who live in the city as well. We have to try and work on a balance, I think, between what's good for the people who come here, and they are very welcome, 
and the requirements and needs of the host community as well. For a few years, the balance of the city and the festivals was put on hold. Thanks to the pandemic, the 2020 Fringe was cancelled. And while the 2021 Fringe went ahead, it only had 500 shows, far cry from the 3,500 this year, and mostly outdoors. The atmosphere is still as great. I think it's a very different vibe this year, which is nice. I think it's getting back into the swing of footfall and things like that, but people are definitely coming up for less time and being able to see less things, which means means that people aren't willing to take as many risks as they probably previously were able to. That's Camille Hainsworth again, who we heard from in episode one and earlier in this episode. Camille is a former Fringe performer and regular Fringe punter. As the Fringe made a slow return to normal, it did so with 500 fewer shows than in 2019. What COVID has changed, I think, is it forced that sort of reckoning with the role of the festival in the city and almost forced everybody to step back and think about what were they risking and why and and what were they bringing to the festival and why. So I'm Lindsay Jackson and I am the Deputy Chief Executive of the Edinburgh Festival Fringe Society. The Fringe has always been a place where artists take the risk to bring their work here. But many of those artists were working and all of their secondary work had fallen apart as well because we just all had to stay inside. So I think that balance of risk and opportunity, people are more thoughtful about and a more thoughtful engagement with why you would come to the festival when it is quite a lot of work and quite a lot of energy required from you. If you're nervous about the situation after the endemic lockdown, then people play safe. They're not interested in taking risks and in many ways they can't commercially afford to take a risk. Tommy Shepard MP again. So they, they go for what they know and they pile on top of each other in this small area of the city. So if you want to do something about that, really, you need a public infrastructure and uh, political leadership of that infrastructure that tries to do something about it. And that means that you need to look and have a dialogue both with the city government and the Scottish government, indeed possibly even the union government, about uh, what contribution they can make to this. And there is some public support. I, I think there probably should be more public support for a, a thing of this size. It's like having the Olympic Games in town every single year. Uh, and yet the level of scandalous in terms of infrastructure and, and public support is, is really quite minimal. So that ought to be in, in, increased, but the, it ought to be increased in such a way that it tries to develop this huge thing more to the benefit of the people who live here. And that, and that means having incentives, financial incentives for people to move to different areas and being prepared to underwrite production costs or having partnerships with people. It means providing the infrastructure to allow that to happen, shuttle buses or whatever it is to get people physically from one part to to another. And that's the debate we're sort of scratching around but haven't really properly got into yet. As the debate continues, a festival founded on risk continues with people evaluating the risk they can take and the opportunity it provides. One potential repercussion could be found in the program. It's always exciting when the program comes out and shows are announced for the Fringe. You start to make your schedule. Spreadsheets are filled in. Google Maps consulted. Or at least that's what I do. And years passed. If you missed a show one day, you could go the next day or several days later. But as I made my schedule for this year's Fringe, I noticed more and more shows with shorter runs. There's never been as many one week or 10 day runs as there are this year. There's a huge drain on resources. That's Sam Goff from Summer Hall talking to me on the first day of Fringe. Each show at the Fringe has to do a tech rehearsal. Depending on the complexity of the show, tech can last for hours. Even though artists get technicians usually independent of the venue, the venue still needs one of their people there for lots of reasons, such as ensuring the artists have everything they need or there isn't anything that could be some kind of hazard. More shows mean more tech rehearsals. It also means more marketing and more coordinating with more production teams. Conversations with colleagues in other venues, they're finding it really hard to program their festivals this year because people are only wanting to do one or two weeks and not the full run. Fortunately, we are not as badly affected as others, but it is a significant issue for a lot of spaces. Shorter runs not only put a strain on venues, but they affect when theater programmers, TV and film casting directors, and others connected to the industry could or would come. It also means a show might lose out on reviews. But if artists have to accept a shorter run in favor of less financial risks, are shorter runs the future? And if so, what does that mean for the future of The Fringe? Character comedy, turn death into a living, one o'clock. Okay, turn death into a living, character comedy, one o'clock, four stars. As we begin flyering again, Neve is very personable. 
talking to people, punters, and other performers. While I may cover more ground, I think Neve makes more impact. At 11 o'clock, I meet the student Neve hired to hand out flyers every day. Neve heads back to her venue to get ready, and I head to a coffee shop that makes it very clear by the multiple signs posted throughout that Harry Potter was not written there. Coming up, I sit down with Neve after her show to chat about audience numbers, poster misdeeds, and how she's managing in the thick of Fringe. I also catch up with Hannah on my last night to talk about how a moment can be a lot longer than you think. Hi, listeners. I hope you're enjoying the episode. If you're thinking, that girl needs a coffee, you'd be right. Except I don't drink coffee, I drink tea, which is very un-American of me. But if you'd like to support the show and buy me a coffee, which I will use to buy a tea, you can go to fringebenefitspod.com. That's fringebenefitspod.com. Thanks so much for all your support. Enjoy the rest of the episode. I feel like my average audience size was eight. And I think I would say probably a third of performances were less than eight people. That's Christina Murdoch from Dangerous Giant Animals, which I worked on in 2018. You also heard from her at the beginning of the episode and in previous episodes. I mean, honestly, there is a very big reality at Edinburgh Fringe of zero people in the audience. So I was so grateful whenever I had more than one. I think my lowest number was three. So you never discount anyone from taking the time and giving their money to sit in your show for an hour to pick your show out of the 300 options that day. So I always felt it was a big honor and I was very grateful. And I just wanted to give them as good a show as I gave anyone else, maybe even a better show because they, again, were really making it happen. And if they hadn't shown up, it wouldn't have happened. As I take a seat at Neve's show, I try to see if anyone I spoke to turned into a ticket. And just like her preview, as soon as I entered the room, Neve is Anya. The audience is keen and laughing. In the end, Neve sold 23 tickets to her show, just over a third of capacity. Not bad in fringe terms. After her show, I wait as Neve gathers her things before the next show comes to set up. We find a room just off the hallway where her show was. Neve has done around 11 shows at this point in the Fringe without a break, in addition to flyering every day. One of the reasons I chose midway through the Fringe to come is it's this time when most artists are feeling it. They've been going almost two weeks without a break. I'm quite exhausted now. I think that show, there was a lovely audience, but I was feeling quite, what's the word? Yeah, just low energy. But Mm -hmm. I think I was fine. Honestly, I couldn't tell. If you remember, Neve was really apprehensive about The Fringe. After seeing Friends and other people's shows, it all seemed a little much. But now that she's in the thick of it and halfway through, what does she think of it? When you come as an audience member and you just drop in for a couple of days, it is a very overwhelming place. Mm -hmm. And that's all I'd ever done. So that was the impression that I got. But I think once you're here with your own show, you build your own routine and it kind of becomes like a bubble on your own world for a month. So it's actually a lot easier than I was expecting in that way. And also, I don't get to perform that much when I'm in my normal life as much as I'd like to be doing it all the time. So to wake up every day and do what you love is pretty amazing. Neve said that that has been the biggest surprise for her. She thought it'd be a slog, but there has not been one day she didn't want to do the show. Yes, there have been days she had more energy than others, but overall her audiences have been nice and she's enjoyed it. Her audience numbers have been pretty good, on average 20 people. As I mentioned earlier, the day before she had a nearly sold out show with 50 people. And that was like incredible because when I turned up, I think I'd sold about 30. So obviously a 20 book that morning. And I also flyered some people who like came in and that's always nice, although a little bit pressurizing (laughs) when they sit on the front row and you're like, I promise it's funny. Everything I said to you in the street is true. Neve was grateful because she knew some people weren't having the same experience. There are some people who are selling out, obviously, and then there's other people who are clearly struggling. Even shows that I've seen have got really good reviews from really big newspapers and things are still struggling to get audience in. So yeah, I think Sometimes there's no rhyme or reason or you're not really sure like why that's happening. But speaking to most of these other performers when I'm flyering and stuff, I normally get chatting to people on the Royal Mile and like, how's it going? How's your show going? Which is really nice and just kind of get more of a sense of what it's been like for different people, you know? Even though she was having an overall positive experience, Neve was still having to work two days a week. I had, such, I had the first week off, so I had a really nice, like, gentle easing myself in to the fringe life. And then it was like, reality check. I've got to get onto my work emails. I mean, no one really wants to do that when they're in that headspace. So 
I think I can say that and my manager will understand <laughs> what I mean. But I'm just trying to look at it from a gratitude point of view that I was able to come, that they were so supportive to let me come and keep my job and logging in for two days isn't the end of the world. But it is difficult and I wouldn't recommend doing this. I think it'd be better to find a way to take the whole month off because it's just draining. Then there was another matter. And let's talk about the crime that was committed. Your poster got stolen. Oh, Yeah. Outdoor advertising is very expensive in Edinburgh. A lot of people don't even bother, which I can see why, because it's a lot of money. But I bought four railing posters. I was flying yesterday up at Bristow Square and I looked across the main road where I knew one of my own posters were and it was gone. And honestly, it really hurt my soul, Molly. And I started crying on the street. I was like, who took my poster? It's so mean. It's so expensive. And I'm sure it was just somebody who was drunk or something. It's hard to know. I feel, is it targeted? Is it not? Is it somebody just being silly? Is it somebody just wants it for their room? But I just want people out there to know that it costs a lot of money and most of us artists do not have it to spare and please don't take our posters down. Yeah, so let's pause right here. Never take a poster down at the Fringe. Someone paid a lot of money for that poster and if there is one thing we have learned on this podcast, there is not enough money to go around. So leave the posters alone because artists have to pay to replace them and Neve is only halfway through her run at this point. Thinking back to the beginning of her journey and now being here halfway through the run, does Neve think she would do it again? Yeah, I'm already like, what can I bring next year? <laughs> I think I'd want to do something different, but I don't know. We'll have to see. It's very expensive. There's a lot of variables involved. I don't know if I could necessarily go for a whole month next year, but it definitely hasn't. Put, so far, unless something horrible happens in the next two weeks, <laughs> it hasn't put me off going again. No. We'll find out if anything changed her mind in the last episode. But for now, as I wrap up my time with Neve, I ask her how she's feeling the day before her last and only day off. Exhausted, but happy inside. <laughs> as I leave Neve, I check my watch and see that I can make a show I've been eyeing. I consult Google Maps just to be sure, and off I go racing up another ancient hill. In my four days at the Fringe, I see 13 shows, including Neve and four of Hannah's, and walk over 13 miles. It would have been 16 shows, but three were sold out. There have been reports about audience numbers, and while the maths check out, I observed, on average, higher audience numbers. In years past, I wouldn't thought anything about being one of only a couple people in an audience. This year, there is only one show with an audience of 12 in a 125-seater. Most shows I went to had a minimum of 40% capacity. With 500 fewer shows, it means more audience members for those that remain. Let's do it. Yeah. On my last night at the Fringe, I meet up with Hannah at Abattoir. Underbelly's pop-up members-only bar. I'm flagging a bit at the moment. We've got four shows. They're up, they're running. Some are selling really well. Some are getting lovely reviews. Some are not selling very well at all. Some are being picked up really well by reviewers and being understood really well. Some are not. Hannah's fifth show had debuted the day before. At a time when anyone with one or two shows at the Fringe would be exhausted, Hannah is really feeling the middle of the Fringe because, on top of her producing duties, the assistant stage manager for the production with seven cast members got COVID. So I'm now the stage manager, as well as the producer. I've still got my head in everything else that I'm doing as well. So reading all the show reports, keeping up and everything else, talking to people about money and kind of monitoring everyone's health and well-being and trying to stay on top of seeing which programmers are coming to which shows and networking. And Liv has also told me that she's going to be leaving at the end the fringe she's not going to be staying on as assistant producer so that's now kind of in my head as well which is totally understandable and that's fine but yeah it's it's the very middle my friend saw me last night she was like are you sure you're enjoying yourself and i was like oh nobody's enjoying themselves at this point of fringe like we'll look back on it in september and be like oh god that was awful but also great but this is the point where fringe is like the bit of childbirth where you want to push it back in but you can't and you have no choice but to go it and just do it anyway because it's only going in one direction you know i think fatigued is probably fair like in in every sense of the word I mean, I'm physically tired and my feet hurt. But when you're building towards this moment for so long, the problem is that it isn't a moment. It's three and a half weeks of a moment. Hannah told me she was dreaming about the camper van she had hired for after the fringe when she could just turn everything off and not worry about missing an email or phone calls. A few days before we spoke, she had taken a few hours to meet up with her grandmother and take a walk. She put her phone on silent, and in those three hours, one of her artists got sick and had to cancel a show. And my assistant producer was the one that was contacting, like, the core team. No, she did wonderfully. I wasn't actually needed, but... God, like, of course, Sod's Law, you've got five shows and they've all been, four of them have been running since the 2nd of August. You take one three-hour break off <laughs> to cuddle the dog <laughs> and then talk to your family. And it's the one time that something goes wrong. So it, it does constantly feel like my nervous system is like, we can't sit down, we can't switch off. Yeah. Must stay vigilant, which is 
it's just, yeah, it's a marathon. And what a marathon it's been. One of the venue's ticketing systems went down for two hours before a show, meaning some punters couldn't buy tickets. Another venue had five fire alarms go off within the first few days of the festivals, meaning shows that were going had to be evacuated. None of the shows that Hannah is working with was affected, but she was sitting in a show that was, and it meant the audience missed out on the ending of the show, and the show missed out on reviews. And people have missed out on that word of mouth. They've missed out on that social media mentioning. They've potentially missed out on that review because the reviewer does not have time because that's now pushed their day back. They have to go to the next thing and they may miss out on a review that's really important to them or a publication that they really wanted to get in because of the fire alarm. We also had technical issues in one space because a show before them kept pulling out all the cables of the sound and lighting set. So each time the performer and tech came in, they had to redo everything in addition to the setup and the performer getting ready, which including warming up her voice for a one-person musical. On the whole, audience numbers were good. On average, the shows were getting around 50% audience. Some days a show would sell out or nearly sell out, then other days there'd only be a few tickets sold. There was only one show that might not make 10% of ticket sales, but the show right after them in the same venue was having the same issue. Hannah told me they would need to fly her four to six hours a day to get ticket sales up, and they didn't have the money to pay for it or the capacity. If a show is selling well, then you don't ever question your marketing decisions. But when a show is selling not so well, for whatever reason, that's always a point where you go back and question yourself on marketing. A lot of those marketing decisions came down to money. But she was feeling heartened because she realized she and her productions weren't the only ones feeling the cost-saving pressures. She a few days ago, I got an email from somebody at a very well-known fringe magazine to say that they had some spare, full spa full page ad space for their issue that was going to be out in the next sort of three days. And did I want discounted ad space? And I was like, how discounted? Because we don't really have the yeah, budget yeah, to do yeah, any yeah. extra. And basically, it was about a 75% discount on a full page wow. ad in this leading advertiser. So we sort of had five hours whatever, to turn around to design and check in with all the shows. And are you happy to all put money in to have this full page spread of all of our work and this and Rose Arts, this logo in the middle and we turned it around and yeah and that's when it struck me that not only are there fewer shows here this year because people couldn't afford to do the show but even the people that have everybody's struggling because nobody has the same capital to put into advertising as they did before so that's made me feel a little bit better. It also reflected on the other differences with the festival this year. There's a lot of industry spaces that are a bit dead. I mean, we're sat in Abattoir and it's half past seven. And yes, it's just after the day off, but everybody's just had a day off. I would have expected this to be buzzing and it's not. And I'm not being bleak about it. You know, the, the festival is, is still great. There's lots of people here. There's less shows. So there's more audience to go around and there's more audience back here. And for lots of reasons, it's still good. But it is a bit weird because it is a bit damper than it felt before. Being so busy, she also didn't have time to do important networking. That is one crucial advantage of the Fringe. I think I would say if, if there's anybody listening who is listening because they're interested in doing this sort of thing is that <laughs> I think Five Shows was pretty optimistic only because it's great to have this like program of work and I've not done it single-handedly because there's been other like core creatives and other leadership like leadership in position for all of them but I've been working so hard that I haven't had a moment to network really I have done a little bit of it but I think there's probably a better balance to be struck in terms of doing enough work, but also leaving yourself open enough to have the energy to have good conversations and continue to meet people and create future opportunities. Because I have managed to do that a little bit and I've created a few and that's been lovely, but I haven't felt like I've had the capacity. And that's like a lot of what Edinburgh is for, is that opportunity to meet people and be in the same space for a few days in a way that you never would normally be if you live at opposite ends of the UK. There was a bright spot. Hannah told me she finally received the money from Monzo that was stolen. As we started to come to the end of our conversation, I asked Hannah about the big elephant in the room. As you recall from episode one, Hannah told the productions. I went back to the five artists. I said, I will produce your show and I will raise the money for your show to make it happen. And I will charge a producing fee out of the money that I raise. If I don't raise the money, you don't pay me. And last we left Hannah, she hadn't raised all the money. So as of right now, you're not making anything from these shows? Nope. And... Do you expect that to change once ticket sales? Not necessarily, because the ticket sales will go to pay the core creative team. My agreement with the artists was no raise, no fee. So my fee was dependent on what money I raised for them. And then when we got to a point where 55 grand is an amazing amount to raise out of 180, but it's also a long way off 180. And if I had said, whoops, it looks like we've only raised 25, I'm just going to give it back and we're going to cancel all this. 
that would have been very sad and I would just never have done that and if we'd raised all of the money then obviously we would have been dancing and it would have been great raising a, a portion of the money which is just enough that nobody wants to give up but is also not enough to do a lot of core things is quite a difficult position to be in and one I probably should have foreseen a little bit better but you have to do these things to learn I think so yeah it would be if any of the artists were to make enough from ticket sales that we pay back relative investors and what they're due and then their core costs and the core cost of the creative team and the cost of the fringe and PR and all these things were all covered and then they had leftovers that they wanted to split back that would be their decision but it wouldn't be one that I would ask for because it wasn't the terms that I came in on and realistically for most of the companies that's not gonna that's not gonna happen. I was concerned with how she was going to support herself after working for months without pay. She told me that she has universal credit and someone was going to be living in her London flat for two months. She also applied for a grant that helps theater professionals who need a break or financial assistance. I sort of don't regret any of it, but I think it does add to the fatigue. I went into this with my eyes wide open and, well, maybe not. I went into it very optimistic, but also there's enough happened in my life that I've got a realistic sense of the world. And I knew quite a long time before this that I wasn't going to be paid an awful lot, if anything, past a certain point. But yeah, I think that adds to the fatigue when you're making quite serious decisions about your own personal finances, even when you're working 70, 80 hours a week. That's quite tough. As I sat on the train on the way back to London, I thought about the past few days. In a lot of ways, the fringe seemed like it hadn't changed at all. There were still shows that I didn't think would work anywhere else. There were still shows that I think the world should see. Some shows inspired me. A lot of shows made me laugh. Some made me cry. A few did both. Some shows were just okay. I thought of Neve and how she surprised herself. I thought of Hannah and the hard work of optimism. I also thought about the one thing that even a pandemic couldn't stop. Artists still hoping, risking, and telling stories. In one of our earlier conversations, I told Neve how I would describe that sort of behavior. You've heard part of this conversation in an earlier episode. I think especially when you get to like your early 30s, you're thinking about having children. And when an old me in my 20s would have been like, well, I'll just quit my job and go to Edinburgh because like, I want to go to Edinburgh and I'll make it work and I'll be really broke or I'll whatever. I'll figure it out when I get back. But I couldn't leave my job because it's tied up with me getting a mortgage. So there was definitely a moment where I said, like, they don't let me go. I don't know what I'm going to do because I can't just turn around and say, oh, I'll leave then. This is more important to me. So I think it's an uh, interesting time. Yeah. Oh, definitely. But it's it's bravery to try it, right? Because you said if you don't do it now, when are you going to do it? Yeah, exactly. It is brave to keep putting yourself out there and telling stories in a world that seems to make it more and more difficult. According to Merriam-Webster, that is literally the definition of bravery. The quality or state of having or showing strength to face difficulty. So as I sat there reflecting on how the fringe can be difficult in the best circumstances, I thought about something Christina Murdoch and I talked about before I came to the fringe. I loved it as a visitor last year, and it definitely made me go, now that I've done this, like I can do it. Like I've been through the hardest part. Now I know what I'm getting into. But I will say it's so financially challenging. There's so little help. And I have so much privilege. I choose to live in this country. I had a day job. I have a day job. I was able to crowdfund through my community. I'm a woman. I'm white. I'm able-bodied. I'm neurotypical. I have all these privileges and I had a hard time. All my friends with disabilities will not go to Fringe on the basis of it is so ableist and it is so not friendly to disabilities. And then the racism that has been documented, especially in recent years, but for many, many years before that, So what if you are disabled in a city full of ancient hills or have to deal with racism on top of doing a daily show? How is the fringe for you? In the penultimate episode, we talk to two people who would know. Next time on Fringe Benefits Edinburgh. Some of the venues I would love to play, I can't because I will not do a show that a disabled person cannot get into. It's a hefty burden to carry, and no one company should carry it. And I don't know if we're the best company to do this, but at the meantime, we are doing it. Fringe Benefits Edinburgh was written, produced, edited, and hosted by me, Molly Merwin. Script consultant, Tom Noonan. 
Original music by Colette Jonas. Supporting producer, Alex Merwin. If you liked this episode, please like and follow or subscribe wherever you listen so you know when new episodes come out. And maybe give us a five-star rating. It helps continue podcasts like these. Thanks. Thanks.